Good morning. Thank you, SG Girls, for the song that you have shared with us. I'm very happy that I can be here with you and share with you this week in learning more about our identity in Christ. When I look at you, I remember many, many years ago when I was also in high school. Unfortunately, I didn't spend my high school years in AUP Academy. But my brother, Bruce, he spent his years at AUP Academy. And he graduated from here. And when I told him that I was going to speak as a, in the week of prayer, he told me to send his regards. An alumni from Indonesia. Bruce sends his regards to his former teachers and also to the students in here in AUP Academy. Okay, so our our theme is identity in Christ. And this morning we're going to talk about the importance of identity. How many of you think that identity is important? Okay, why is it important? Why? Because it is what defines you. It is something that will define who you are. For example, if somebody asks what my identity is, I can say many things. But the fact is, my name is Brian Sumenda. My name is Brian Sumenda. Therefore, identity is something that defines you. And so when I, I want to project these images on screen, I want to see if you identify with this image. I want to see your hands up. When I project this first image, who identifies with this image? Okay, what is this image? The coat of arms of Philippines. Okay, what about this image? Does anyone associate with this image? Yes, I see one hand at the back. What is this image, my friend? What is that? Myanmar. <laughs> This is the coat of arms of Myanmar, okay? How about this one? Can anyone identify with this image? Does anyone identify with this image? What is it? No, this is Pakistan. <laughs> How about this one? Can anyone identify with this image? Okay, do we have any Koreans here? Okay, we have many Koreans. What about this image? Oops, it doesn't come out. There, what about this image? Indonesia, how many? Do, are there are Indonesians here? Okay. So what is this bird all about if you are an Indonesian? Tell me. <laughs> this is our coat of arms. We call this the Garuda bird, the mythical bird of Garuda. It has so many things that can be explained, but I don't want to do it right now. I just want us to identify this. Okay, we have seen these images and we tend to identify it to a nation, to a specific nation. The first image was identified with the Filipinos, the coat of arms of Filipinos, for Philippines. And the last image is the coat of arms of Indonesia. 
Before that, it was Korea. And so I want to share you this. There is an interesting story about identity that is in my country, in Indonesia. This is a story that is found in the province of South Sulawesi. In 2005, a Korean professor named Professor Chan Tae-hyun came to his friends at the National Seoul National University. And he told his friends, you know, my dear friends, there is an interesting thing developing in Indonesia. There is a minority group that doesn't have an alphabet. And so Professor Hyun's friend said, so what does it have to do with us? So he said, well, why don't we go and see what we can do to help this minority group? They have a difficulty in writing out their alphabet because their alphabet does not fit the Indonesian alphabet or the English alphabet. They use a very old alphabet which has no vowels, all consonants. And so they went to Indonesia. They went to Indonesia, studied this language together with his two friends, Professor Hu Hyung Lee and Dr. Lee Konam. They made several visits to this place. The place is called Chia Chia in the island of Buton. And in August 6, 2009, the tribe in the city of Bao Bao, located in Buton, Southeast Sulawesi, chose Hangul as the official alphabet to transcribe its original language, according to Hon Min Jung Na Jung Gyum Research Institute. The Indonesian ethnic minority with a population of 60,000 was losing its native language as it lacked a proper writing system, the institute said. Can uh, our friends read this uh, character down there? Can somebody read this? Can you, the Korean characters down there? Can somebody read this for me? <laughs> well, I myself cannot read it also. But if I'm not mistaken, this is transcribed as Bahasa Chia Chia. And I got this from Wikipedia. Korean Wikipedia. And so at that time when they made visits to this uh, island, the mayor said, okay, thank you for studying our language. We want to try to learn this Korean alphabet system and we want to teach it to our children so that they can have an alphabet system that will preserve their traditional dialect. And so the Korean Institute help this, this village, and they published even a textbook in Korean. It contains values, stories that will be taught to the children. Even in many places, they have signs that show an Indonesian word and the Korean transliteration. Isn't this amazing that uh, a, a minority group is adopting another set of alphabet system so that their identity as a group will not diminish. Although it was an identity that was copied from another set of uh, values, it was something that will help them to continue identifying themselves. In October 2010, the town official told Korea Times that the mayor had been consulting with Indonesian government on adopting Hangul, which would be an exception to the stipulation in Indonesia's basic law that all tribal languages must be recorded in Roman letters to preserve national unity. 
And so Chai Tai Hyun said that reports of official adoption has been based on a mistranslation of the mayor's statement. However, by that time, the number of students learning this alphabet had risen to 190. Although it was still controversial, but they have tried to emerge with a new alphabet system so they can still maintain their identity. The Indonesian law doesn't allow any other languages to be written in a, in a, foreign, a foreign alphabet. But they're still working on it. And these people in Chia Chia are emerging to learn the Korean alphabet system so that they can preserve the, their identity as a tribe. And so my question is, if they use, if they use Korean alphabet, are they Koreans? Do they become Koreans? Or do they, or are they still Indonesians? What do you think? They are still Indonesians. Yes, they are still Indonesians. Although they adopt the Korean alphabet system, they are still Indonesians. How about us? When I ask you, who are you? What will be your answer? Who are you? I am a boy. You can say that, right? I am a girl. I am a student. I am a son. I am a daughter. I am a sister or a brother. I am a Christian. I am a Seventh-day Adventist. Or maybe you can answer by what you are interested to do. You can say, I am an artist. I am a computer geek. I am an athlete. And all these things can be an answer to the identity. And so in relation with identity, it is important for us to carry one. I know one of your regulations in school is to always wear your ID card. What is in your ID card? Your name? What else? Picture. That is important. And in your ID card, it tells you, it signifies on what section or level you are in, right? And at the back, it will have your principal signature. And so ID, identity is very, very important. The meaning of identity, it is defined by the Encarta Dictionary is the name or essential character that identifies somebody or something. So in this context, our identity is found in the name of our church the Seventh-day Adventist. You know, I want to take this illustration as traveling, of traveling as, as something that we can relate to. How many of you have traveled by airplane? Okay, most of us have traveled by airplane. What do you do when you enter, when you, for example, if we are going to fly in a cheap airline, Cebu Pacific. What happens the first time you enter, you come in with your luggage as soon as you enter, you are going to enter the terminal? What does the guard ask you? Your ID, your ticket, okay? As soon as you enter, he asks you for your ticket or your ID and your ID. As soon as you check in, what does the, uh, the person in charge there ask you for? Passport, ticket. When you check in your luggage, you go out. As soon as you arrive in the place where you have to pay your terminal fee, what does the lady in the counter ask you for? Your ID and show your boarding pass. You pay your 750 pesos and you're on your way. When you arrive at the security area, 
When they frisk you, they put your things in the, in the scanner. Then you go inside. As soon as you enter the waiting room, you are then on your way to the aircraft. What do they ask you for again? Your ticket, boarding pass. These are all forms of identification to identify you to say that you are really who you claim to be. Isn't it? As soon as you ride on the airplane, one hour later, two hours later, or three hours later, as soon as you touch down on the destination, if it is in a foreign country, when you go to the immigrations, what do they ask for? Again, they will ask for your passport, your identification mark, your identification mark. And so you see, my dear friends, identification is very, very important. And for us as young people, we need to have our identity. And so this week, we're going to talk about our identity in Christ. What is our identity in Christ? We're going to study that every meeting in the morning and in the afternoon. As I mentioned here, we identify ourselves as a student, as a Seventh-day Adventist. But maybe not all of us identify ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists. But we all identify as Christians, isn't it? We are all Christians. But for us who identify ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists, Mrs. White says that we have to be proud. We have to be proud of being Seventh-day Adventists. In Selected Messages Book 2, page 384, we are Seventh-day Adventists. And of this name, we are never to be ashamed. And so, my dear friends, our journey here on earth is just like our journey as a traveling. Traveling to a destination where we are all hoping to be in. And as travelers in the, our journey to heaven, we must have an ID. We must have an identity card that will be an evidence of who we are. Our identity can be described as distinctiveness, uniqueness, particularity, character, or integrity. And so by definition, the identity of an Adventist youth should be a distinct, unique, and noble character. The year 2011 has been designated as the year of identity for the Seventh-day Adventist youth around the world. We identify ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists because we keep the Seventh-day holy. We are waiting for Jesus' coming. That is why we identify ourselves as that. And as a child of God, we have to keep up this identity and hold it up. And so I want to enter into this passage just to remind you again of what our identities are as youth, as Christians, as we are traveling to heaven. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10. How many of you ma ma memorizes this passage? Oh, I see one hand. <laughs> Would you like to come forward and memorize it for us? <laughs> okay, shall we read this passage together? Can you read it? Let us start reading. But you are a chosen race, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. But now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I want to go quickly and study the 
definition, the parts of this passage. You see, the first thing that I want to emphasize to you in this passage is that we are a chosen race. A chosen race does not mean because you are black, you are white, you are yellow, you are red. No, we are a chosen race because we are a new people from all peoples. We are a different kind of youth. We are ones that God has chosen. Before we were aliens, we were strangers in the world. But in verse 11, it says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. What gives us our identity in this context as a chosen race is not because of our culture or because of our color. Because you are a Filipino, because you're an Indonesian, because you're a Korean, because you're a Chinese. No, that is not what gives our identity as a chosen race. We are these races of white race, black race. We are the one chosen at one time as a group, as a young people. Our generation has been chosen to become God's people. You are the one chosen. You know, being chosen is something is something special. Yeah, when. Uh, when I watch The Biggest Loser, the Filipino version. Huh? Do you watch that also? Yeah, there are two kinds of chosen there. There's the one that is chosen to go home. And late, later part, there will be one chosen as a winner. And as a chosen race, as young people, we are a chosen race so that we can become winners. That is the importance of this passage. You are a chosen race. The next one that I want to emphasize in this passage is we are pitied. What is pity in Tagalog? Awa. We are people because God had pitied us. Verse 10, B, it says, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So when God chose us, when God chose us, He saw that in our sin and in all the things that we always do that is wrong, He has pity on us. We are not just chosen, but God had pity on us. And so that is why as young people, we can say, I have the grace of God. I am loved by God. I am loved by God. God did not just choose me to be proud of myself, but He chose me and drew me close so that I can show others that God also is choosing them to become like me as a chosen one, as a pity one, pitied one. And the third thing I want to emphasize here is you are chosen, you are pitied, you are God's possession. This verse is expressed twice, this expression of God's possession. Verse 9, it says, you are a people for God's own possession. And in verse 10a, it says, you once were not a people, but you are now a people of God. As young people, you have been chosen you have been shown mercy and grace. You have been pitied. And you are God's possession. Have you ever held a possession that you hold dear in your life? You know, I once, I once had a car. We bought this car. It was new. And that was my first time in my life to ride a new car. And then it became my pride possession. Because among my friends that are pastors, I was the only one who had a new car. And so I became very proud. And you know what happened? Something very stupid I did. On that Friday that I bought the car, 
that following Sabbath, I had to go to my church. And my church that I was serving was out of way. It was not in the main road, but you had to go off road. And then I know that in that road that they are, that they are, that, that, that is leading to the church, it has so many shrubs. And then when a pa car passes by, it is going to scratch the sides. So you know that Sabbath morning, I got a bolo, I put it on my car, and then I went to church. As soon as I arrived in that place, I cut, you know, the, I went down, got the bolo, and I cut the shrubs. So it will not scratch my car. Remember, this was my proud possession, right? So I cut it, and my wife was laughing at me. And I said, what? What are you doing? I said, this is, this is a new car. It's just one day old. I have to take care of it. So I cut it there, and then I went to church. And as soon as I arrived in church, I asked the church elder, church elder, come here. Come here. What is it, pastor? Um, I parked the car right in the middle so that I can see it. And I told him, you know, I don't want children playing near my car. I don't want them to get their cars and start scratching and say, boom, 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 on the side. No. Please assign a deacon to look after my car so that the children will not play. Oh, okay, okay, pastor. And so, somebody was taking care of the kids so that they will not go near the car. And I went to the pulpit and I start preaching. I start preaching and preaching and preaching. And I saw one child coming close to the car. I saw another one coming close to the car and they had their cars from Sabbath school. And they were about to put their car on the side of my car and they were going to say, boom, boom, boom. Oh, you know what happened? I look at it and I, I look at the church elder. Where is the church elder? I look down. I said, where's the church elder? And I saw him and I said, and I was continuing preaching and I just told him, You know, if you have something that you possess very well, you will really take care of it. But in my case, that is not good. I realized that mistake that I have made that possession as an idol. Yes? But in our case, God made us as his possession as something very precious. He could have made us as his idol too because he takes care of us. He loves us. And he wants the best for us in our life. You are chosen by God. You are pitied by God. And the fact of that pity is mercy. God takes us as his own possession. And now God owns us. God owns us. As young people, you know, we have to remember that God owns us. And because God owns us, everything that we have technically belongs to him. If he gave us the talent to sing, use it for him. If he gave us the talent to lead our friends in a group, use it for the positive influence that you can have. Because of our identity as God's possession. And then, number four, we are holy. We are holy, verse 9, he says, you are a holy nation. You have been chosen, you have been pitied, you have been possessed by God, and now you are not a part of this world anymore. You are set apart for God. You exist for God. And since God is holy, you are holy. But let us not forget something. Just because you are holy does not mean that you should, you should not be with your friends who are not yet in the same position as you are. Because you are holy, you have stay, to stay away of the influences of unholiness, but you have to be in that place so that you can show your influence as a holy people, as young people who are holy to God. You share his character because he chose you, he pitied you, he possessed you. And the last one is, you are a royal priest. What is the function of a priest? In Old Testament time, the function of the priest is to be 
a mediator between people and God. Verse 9 says, you are, whole, you are a royal priesthood. You are chosen by God, pitied by God, possessed by God, holy like God, and royal priests to God. The point here is that you have immediate access to God. You have immediate access to God. You don't need another human priest as mediator because Jesus has become your mediator in heaven. And you have to share this influence. You have to share this influence. You are called to minister in the presence of God. And so, brothers and sisters, my dear young friends, what is your identity? Who are you? When we are asked this question, what are you here for? You should know how to answer. Your identity in Christ is because you are chosen, you are pitied, you are possessed, you are holy, and you are to function as ministers to tell others about God's mercy that you have experienced and that God desires for others to also experience. And so, in having this identity, it does not come just as your identity, but it comes with responsibilities that is entitled with this identity. You know, there was one day, I want to tell you a story. One day there was a class, a college class. They were taking the course or Ornithology, which is the study of birds. This class has a reputation as being a most difficult class in the whole curriculum. And the professor was an extremely difficult professor. All the students were afraid of this professor. But since it is a required course, everyone should sit in this class. As this course began, the first day of class, the professor said, in 40 days, you will have a quiz. And this quiz will compose a large portion of your grade. So you have to do very well in this quiz. So during those 40 days, these, these students, they took notes. They did everything. They tried to memorize everything what the professor had taught them. And then at that particular date, on the 40th day, the professor welcomed them in the classroom. And on the table, there was a cage. Five cages on the table. Each cage had a cover. And it covered the whole portion of the cage, only revealing the part of the feet of the birds. The feet and legs. And he said, class, the quiz today is for you to identify the feet and leg of the bird and tell me what kind of bird is it. <laughs> and so all the students said, wow, we studied everything, but he just wants us to identify with a leg. This is impossible. And so at the sound of the bell, the professor said, here is the test. You see, there are five birds you identify and then that's it. If you pass this test, you have a big grade already. Most of your grades will lead you to an A. So one student said, This is ridiculous, professor. We have studied so much about so many things that you have asked us to study, and now you just want to look at, uh, at the feet and legs of the bird. What is this? And the professor said, Young man, this is not to be tolerated in this school. And I don't want this school anymore. I am leaving. And the professor said, young man, what is your name? I'm going to bring you to the student affairs. And the student said, you see, professor, you see? You see? Look at me. Try to identify me. So he pulled out his legs and said, now try to identify me, professor. And bring me to the student affairs. 
identity. Identity is very important. In our study, we have we have uh, defined ident our identity as young people, as young people in Christ. But we have responsibilities that come with it. We have a responsibility. As a chosen race, as a holy nation, we should not be like this young man. As a student, he still didn't abide. We are required to show certain characteristics. And so I want to close with this last passage. 1 John 3 verses 1 and 2. I want to read it for you. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, we are now children of God. And that we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as he is we are the children of god isn't it great just now we said we are a chosen race we are one that is pitied well, we are children of god god has given us this title and so we should bear it proudly so that when christ comes again we are going to be like him we are going to see him as he is this reminds me of the story that I want to share with you in closing. A story of Viktor Naworski. Are you familiar with this? What is it? Viktor Naworski. Viktor Naworski was from a country in East Europe. And he traveled to the U.S and arrived at JFK International Airport. He arrived with a passport of Krakosia. As soon as he arrived, he didn't know that on his way coming, coming to the U.S., his country was hit by a revolution. There was a coup in this country. And when he arrived in the United States of America, technically speaking, the U.S. does not recognize his country anymore. And so what should they do with him? With his passport, he showed them, look, I am from Kargovsky. Please let me in. But the, the guy said, no, you cannot because we don't recognize your country anymore. Your country is at war and we, we do not recognize it. And so he said, please let me in. No, but we cannot let you in. So what did they do? They let him stay in the terminal. And if you've already watched, this is from a movie of Tom Hanks. You know what the title of the movie is? Terminal. So he stayed in the terminal. He stayed in the terminal while the people who were responsible to let him in or let him go home decided what to do. They could not send him home because his country is not, not a country anymore. It is in a state of revolution. There is no such country as Karovsky now. So they let him stay there. All the while when he stayed in the terminal, he made friends with people. He made friends with people. He made friends with, an, with a janitor, he made friends with a food seller, and for many weeks he stayed there. Until finally they decided, hey, your country is okay now. You can go home. But he said, no, I cannot go home yet. I have something very important to do in New York. I have to enter New York. You see, my father is a jazz enthusiast. And in this picture, there are many musicians, jazz musicians. Out of all the musicians, I have already all there. My father already had their signatures on their picture. But there is still one musician and he is playing in New York. I need to see him. 
and get his autograph. He had a mission. So finally they pitied him. They said, okay, you can go. We will delay the flight. So he went inside and got the signature of the musician. And finally his mission going to the U.S. is accomplished. And at the end of the movie, they show him riding a taxi. And he said, I am going home. He finally accomplished his mission. And he said, I am going home. And so, my dear friends, indeed, our identity as children of God is sure that we are heading to heaven. Not like Tom Hanks in this movie. In this movie, it was portrayed that his destination, go his homeland, is not sure because of the revolution. But for us, it is sure we are going to heaven and we are traveling in this life as children of God. We are going to study more of what we can do as children of God to continue to explore and find our identity in Christ this week. And so, at the end of this talk this morning, I want to ask you, would you like to join me this week to continue studying about our identity in Christ? Let me see your hands. Yes, thank you. Some of our friends are asleep. They're tired probably. But I hope that in the, this afternoon, we will not all be sleeping because it is very important that we will study. May I ask you to stand with me so that I can pray for you as we continue to study this thing. Thank you. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father God, we thank you for our study this morning. Our identity is important. Our identity is important as we travel this life's journey in our aim to reach heaven. Help us as young people so that we can really, truly discover our identity in Christ. We are the children of God and we want to stay that way until you come home and take us in your heavenly home. Please bless each one of us. In our studies, we may face difficulties Please give us wisdom. We may have financial disabilities. Please help us so that we may be able to come out of it. We may have problems in our family, among our brothers, our sisters, with our parents. Please help us. We are your children. We need your help. Guide us through as we, continue, as we start our journey together in learning about our identity in you. Accept us as we are, dear Jesus. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.